So now, talking about Perry and the opening of Japan, okay. which led to the modernization of Japan. Okay. What did Perry do? Perry. Uh, Who was Perry? Perry was a uh, Commodore mm -hmm. in the American Navy. He was ordered to sail to Japan and establish diplomatic relations, and basically to, to open up the country. Mm -hmm. um, before he went to Japan, he did a lot of research and he for example, he spoke to Siebold. He he wrote well, he wrote a letter to Siebold in Germany. He researched Japan from what little information he could find, of course. Mm. So he wanted to make sure, you know, he was going in knowing a little bit about what he was going to expect. Um, he arrived in the uh, he arrived in Japan, and of course was told that you know we're not going to trade with you. He then threatened to start shelling. Mm -hmm. the, the the city of the shelling, bombarding the city, and of course the Japanese eventually um, gave in, and he returned the following year with I think it was sixteen ships. First mm. time it was eight ships. I think it was sixteen, maybe the next second time, yeah. the black ships as they were called, mm. because the, the hulls were painted black with black with. Um, oh yeah, they definitely left mm. an impression right. on Japan. And I mean the black, the kuro. Well, it was the yeah, kuro, bune. kuro bune, yeah, yeah, bune, sorry, yeah. yeah. That's right. They wore. They were to pitch that they painted the ships mm. with, and um, so basically they, that established the reopening of Japan. And um, Townsend Harris, of course, the American trader, he was he was appointed the first envoy to uh, Japan. He he lived in uh, where was it down in Shimoda for a while, mm -hmm. and then he came up to Tokyo later, and so that they began um, that that began the slow sort of the, the reopening of the country yeah and the thing about with Perry's arrival at that time Japan we talked about the closing of the country mm. uh, Japan was controlled by a military government the yes. shogunate basically yes that's they were of the, you could call them a military government yeah yes. uh, the samurai class was a military yeah, class exactly, exactly for the most part you could um, say that yes and then there was the whole issue of the shogun and the emperor that technically the the shogun followed the orders of the emperor but not really. <laughs> well, no. The emperor yeah. was—he um, lived in Kyoto, and I don't—I mm -hmm. don't—I I don't think the emperor had much say no. in anything no. from from that from, from yeah. a long time ago. Yeah, to be honest. Until Perry showed up, mm. that started uh, that started uh, causing the other domains to see the weakness in the Tokugawa shogunate because they didn't like the way the shogunate was responding mm, to these mm. foreign incursions true that that helped to turn a lot of people's opinions against them yeah, yeah that's because an earlier yeah. incident this perry's was not the first an american attempt to open up japan there was mm. the you mentioned in the book the kendrick uh, um, no uh, uh biddle biddle yes yes biddle was about um five years maybe five years before yeah maybe, five years earlier mm -hmm. yeah and he well of course he just sailed in and he tried to um, arrange a meeting and then they sent him packing basically yeah. that was it but the way the the shogunate responded to it uh, mm. left a bad taste in a, a number of these anti uh, or hostile Tokugawa mm. clans mm -hmm. and that was starting the beginning and then when Perry forced his way into the country mm. and the shogunate had to kind of bow to, to him yeah. in a way yeah and signed these treaties that these clans felt was rather unfair. Right, that well, was the, 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 the ANSEI, ANSEI, yeah. ANSE, the unfair treaties they were called yeah. in English, yeah, that's right. That was, basically you could say that was the beginning of the end for the shogunate oh, yes, government. Oh yes, definitely. And more and more of the samurai were believing, revere the emperor, expel the foreigner. Yes, son no joy. Yes, yeah. Mm. Uh, that's but, right. Yeah, and all of that, you know, just Perry just came there because he wanted trade, mm. and 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 as you said, uh, he wanted supply. Yeah, he wanted it to be well. Essentially, it would be a supply station for yeah. whaling ships and yes. trading ships. Rather ironic that it was American whaling that caused, like, eventually the opening of Japan. And, and yeah, and it's rather ironic if you mention whaling that it was mm. um, it was MacArthur who. Um, basically revived the whaling industry in the 19th yeah. after the World War Two because uh, as, a, as an easy way to find a, a source of protein. Mm -hmm. The irony is that America revived an industry that was probably on its last legs. Oh, yeah. And so there you go. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yay, America. <laughs> oh, no, well, yeah.
But so, so Perry's, um, yeah, arrival caused so much, uh, uh, yeah, turmoil. Of course. And that began what is now known as the Bakumatsu period. Right. From 1853 to 1867. Right. Uh, the, basically the closing days of the shogun mm. government. And you could also say the beginning of the end of the samurai class. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, so from all that turmoil, you started getting foreigners coming into Japan because now they were allowed to come into Japan as per those, right. those was, treaties. I think it was 1861. Mm -hmm. or, yeah, maybe 60 or, 60 or 61. That, uh, no, 1859, maybe something like yeah. that. Some, around that time that they did, they said... They could uh, officially come into right, the country, yeah. But they could only live in certain designated areas mm. such as, for example, Yokohama yeah. and um, I don't remember exactly, Kobe, I think it was, and mm. one or two other... Areas. And that's what brought us to Townsend Harris, the mm. American, mm. Uh, was he a con consul? Well, he was a consul, yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. So he was the first American consul mm. that's right. in Japan. And he wasn't called an ambassador because they didn't have full diplomatic relations. So mm. when you have mm. only partial relations, you refer to them as a consul. Oh, okay. But it, it, they, they fill, fill, fill the same role as an ambassador. Though, I see. And of course, Townsend Harris is... Very famous for other reasons outside of politics. If, mm. uh, well, he was he was famous for the legend. Uh, well, he was famous for uh, maybe as inspiring the legend or of uh, Madame Butterfly. Mm. But um, yeah, well, some people say that. But his the story of of, of um, Townsend Harris and um, Okichi, mm -hmm. who was mm -hmm. the maid who worked mm -hmm. for him, and the legend was that she was his lover and that he mm. abandoned her and she eventually committed suicide, and that was absolute nonsense. <laughs> uh, she was a maid who worked for him for three days, and then he, <laughs> and then he, he ordered her to be, uh, he wanted her to be fired because she had some skin rash, and he was mm. worried she was infected with something, he was worried he was going to catch it. Yeah. So then she demanded, uh, she demanded uh, one month's salary from him, <laughs> and she paid her. So there was not much love lost between them. Yeah. So, um, what but, a lovely story. Oh, it is indeed, isn't it? So, <laughs> sweet. But um, somehow Puccini made that into an art. Well, actually, <laughs> uh, uh, but I should should correct you there, Dave. Um, the main inspiration for um, the, the Madame Butterfly myth came from uh, two sources. One of them was a writer called Luther Long, who was an American mm. writer. He wrote a story called um, uh, Madame Madame Butterfly. I think he called it. it was called Madame Butterfly, which was a story about a, a woman. It was basically, it was more or less the story of uh, the. Japanese lady meets the American sailor, there, mm, mm -hmm. and then she he abandons her and she commits suicide. It was basically that story. Um, there was also another novelist who was he was a Frenchman. I've forgotten his name for the moment. He wrote a novel called Madame Chrysanthemum, ah, which was more or less the same story, except yeah. except Madame Chrysanthemum doesn't die at the end; she survives. Oh, okay. well, that's nice. It's an happy ending. Yes, there you go. And there was also some people say that Glover, uh, mm. Thomas Glover, and his wife uh, Tsuru, who was mm. Japanese, they. Uh, was their, their house was called the Glover House, mm -hmm. but that was a, that was named. They was called that by the American occupation. They they okay. they said this is the Glover House, and um, the Nagasaki government after the war they thought, yeah, great, you know, why not? You know, it's a yeah. tourist thing. What's wrong with it? We'll call it yeah, the Glover House. Hey, hey you know. Okay, well, no, well so, let's talk about Glover then. Okay, well, Glover was an industrialist who came to Japan. In, Thomas Glover, right? Correct. Okay. Thomas Glover came to Japan in eighteen. 60, 60, uh, 69. No, 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 sorry, no, my mistake. 59. Yeah. When he was about 20 years old, 21 years old. Yeah. So yeah. one of the, so one of the first mm. of the for, official foreigners Correct, allowed yeah. into the country. And yeah. That's right. Now, going back to the Madame Butterfly story, it's based on two short stories. Mm -hmm. And one of them was, was basically a woman who was listening to conversations about, about the Yujo, the, the prostitutes in Nagasaki, mm. who had one of them killed, committed suicide. So, um, her brother, American writer, mm -hmm. he wrote the story. And so then Puccini, when he was in London, he watched the opera. I think it was 1900 or thereabouts. He watched this, he watched, not the opera, sorry, he watched the the play based on, oh, based on the novel. Okay. And he, he thought it was wonderful. It inspired him to write, wow, um, Madam, uh, write um, Madame Butterfly. Oh, wow. Chocho-san. <laughs> Chocho meaning butterfly, of course. And so he... Uh, but so the story of Madame Butterfly. Some people actually try to make out it's a real story. Of course, it's not. No. It's like saying Fred Flintstone was a real person, or <laughs> where, where, you know, Luke Skywalker, yeah. the historical Luke Skywalker. I mean, come on, 
you know, of course it wasn't a real story, but lots of people believe it was. But humans did live with dinosaurs, as we know from the Texas history books. Well, absolutely. I mean, it, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, the Flintstones was a, was a was not was, was a, a documentary. documentary. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Good yeah. on you, Texas. Yeah, guns, guts, and God. Let's keep them. But yeah, that's that's very interesting. Mm. How like like such a a very minor incident in Townsend Harris's life mm. suddenly warps into this that's, you know huge love affair, well, and yeah, yeah. sadness. Mm. And, yeah. Well, it was. I mean, and I remember seeing a school textbook when I was uh, teaching. Japanese kids, oh, years and years ago, there was a textbook which actually had this spurious story about Townsend Harris and Okichi. It featured the story of Townsend Harris living with her as, as they were lovers, and mm. then he abandons her. And they were teaching this in a, as, a, as a text to wow. these kids. And they were, it's like, it really happened. Right, they were, teach, wow. they were actually teaching this as a text. I was... I, and at that time, I didn't know it wasn't a true story. I mm. was like, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's plausible. Okay, it's a yeah. plausible story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, but it didn't happen. <laughs> so it's quite funny. But it just shows you know, like how just myths can spread. And, <clears throat> and, and, and again, with Japan, <clears throat> with so much... You, you, you do have a lot of this like exoticism with mm. Japan mm. that uh, goes back to when it was closed, a closed well, off country. Anything that even is, today, anything that is uh, closed off and mm. is not known very much is going to generate all sorts of myths and legends. Yeah, and and, and supersti- well, not superstition. Sorry, myths and legends yeah. and um, misunderstandings. And yeah. you know, it's like you know the, the mysterious East. I mean, the East is not really that mysterious <laughs> when you get to know it. It's, yeah. Yeah, come on. But now, so so related with Madame Butterfly, as we say, is the story of Thomas Glover. Ah, yes. And like he is a very fascinating character. Thomas Glover was um, he was where was he, he from? He was from Scotland. He mm. was from Scotland. He came. He, I think it was uh, Aberdeen. I think it was like, off the top of my head. I don't remember Aberdeen, perhaps. All right. And he came to Japan working for the Thomas Jardine Company when he mm. was. He started well. Actually, he started working in China first, and then came to Japan. And he was—he he just got into everything you can imagine, mm. from uh, selling, you know, exporting tea, uh, exporting tea. Uh, and he started. He made friends with some of the Japanese people, like uh, the uh, members of the, the Satsuma clan, mm-hmm. and helped five of them to smuggle them out of um, Japan and go to the UK. So. Yeah. He helped. So I mean, I could I could probably make I could spend the next hour telling you about the things. <laughs> well, yeah, I was, we take, could do a take whole take video of, of Glover. Uh, he, and I was going to say he brought he, the first steam engine yeah. to Japan. He hmm. brought the first. Uh, he 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 was the first one to introduce the telegraph uh, to make a telegraph. Oh wow! Telegraph, uh, um, I'm trying to think. Of, oh yes, he 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 created Kirin beer. That's right. Yes. Yeah. We'll so many. In moment, we'll, yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll get onto that soon. Yeah. But but also I was going to say if the shogun uh, shogunate wanted to uh, try to stop the uh, the loyalists, the imperial loyalists, mm, mm. from overthrowing them, if they had killed Glover in early days, it might have helped because he was he was so influential mm. because he was a gun runner. One, he was a gun runner. To but you could argue that you could argue that um, he was filling. A gap, and if he hadn't been there, someone else would have. Done. True, but but the fact that it was Glover who did all these. Oh other no, things, I, do, yeah. I don't. Dis- I'm not yeah. trying to diminish what he did. Yeah. I'm just saying that uh, people often wonder what if somebody hadn't yeah. happened, would the history have been different? But it, it seems that probably not. But if there because- was one foreigner that mm. if the shog- shogunate mm. could have killed, that would have protected them maybe for a few years longer. I have no idea. Yeah. I um, think it would have been Glover because. As, as you said, he was running guns to the anti shogunate okay, well, forces. Okay. Let's uh, take this the yeah. other way. Then, if the if the if the Tokugawa shogunate had held on to power, mm. they was they were not they didn't want to stay in the Middle Ages. They no. wanted to modernize too. So yeah. the ultimate the ultimate the end of things would have not been so different. True. It just means that they would have made. They, they, don't forget that the that the the major restoration was not a revolution in the sense of a proletarian revolution. Yeah. It simply meant. Different group of samurai became the boss. Yeah, they they replaced the yeah. Tokugawa with Satsuma and so on, and but the base essentially that that all oh, that's all that's what happened. Yeah. So if if the Tokugawa had con- t- uh, con- maintained, oh power, no, that, that is true. I mean, it, 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 with Perry, it, he hmm. negotiated with the shogunate. Yeah, of course. Yes. And, and, that's what I'm, well, when yeah. I say shogunate and Tokugawa, it's, I'm using yeah. those terms. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Synonymously. Yeah. You know. Uh, but it, I was trying to say like the. Sh- 
well, I would say the irony mm. in, in the Bakamatsu is such a an interesting period mm, of time. Mm, mm. The shogunate is the one that closed off the country. Yes, in the beginning, correct. in the seventeenth correct. century. Yes, correct. Then it was the shogunate that, in a way, opened the country well, with Perry. Because they had no choice. Of course, yeah. they didn't want to. But at, but it was the imperial side that wanted to keep the country closed. That that's the kind of the mm, irony. Because mm, mm. Uh, I yeah. think you you mentioned in the book that there was an imperial edict in 61 or, or 63 from Kome the emperor Kome ah yeah uh, that was which it. said expel the foreigners uh, as, yeah that's right and of course but even then they even even mm. that even then they knew it was impossible yeah. it was a it was a gest- it was it's, I suppose it's what these days you'd call gesture politics yeah as much as anything but it was just interesting that in that early period of time that many of the people that were supporting the uh, mm. the re- restoration of imperial power mm, mm. Uh, one of the foreigners out, but then there was a switcheroo because, kind mm. of leading from that, there mm. was an incident mm. in Kanagawa, I believe, the Nama Namamugi yes incident. Nama, yes, in Japanese Namamugi Jiken. Yes, it's involving where, one of your countrymen. Indeed, it was. Indeed, there was a twenty-eight-year-old trader mm-hmm. who was visiting. He was returning from working. He'd spent ten years in uh, Hong Kong, where he made a lot of money, mm. and he decided on his way back to. England, he would drop off in Japan because you know why not? He wanted Ooh. to visit, so he did. famous last decisions. Yeah. There you go. And so, what happened to him? Uh, well, he fell foul of a group of samurai who mm. were, uh, who were walk the parade of samurai, and he got too close. And he, I, I don't remember. I think he didn't get off his horse, or he didn't mm. bow, or something, and they they killed him. Yeah. So chopped him up. Right. Basically, yeah. Yeah. And then, but what was the British response to that murder? Bombing Shimonoseki? Yeah. Harbour? Yeah, basically it led to uh, the uh, British, I think it was the British consul. Harry the Parks, the, the British consul at the time, mm-hmm. Harry Parks, who said, you know, enough is enough. We're not mm-hmm. going to take this crap lying down. I'm sure he was... Was it Parks or Neils? I think it was Park. Oh, oh, yeah, you could be right. It might have been... Sorry, my mistake. It might have been Niels. But somebody said, yeah, we're going to shell them. Uh, uh, it yeah. might have been Niels. It might have been Park. So I'm... Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, anyway, the British consul yeah, said... Yeah, the British. Gonna, the yes, British. Yes, British let's just say, us. Yeah. Us. And, and it was interesting because, like, that clan mm. before were part of the uh, revere the emperor, expel mm. well, the foreigner. Uh, don't forget, the, the, the five samurai that were sent to... They, well, they smuggled themselves... They were smuggled yeah. out of Japan... They returned to Japan. Mm-hmm. They they were initially part of the Sono Joy movement. Oh yeah, but yeah. By going to England and by seeing the technology and seeing the West, it changed them completely. They yeah. they were totally pro. Like, yeah, the Choshu Five. The Choshu Five, I mean, yeah. exactly. Um, one of them became prime minister, the first prime yeah. minister in Japan. Oh well, we're going to get to that in a minute. Oh, uh, no, I was just saying no, no. Mm-hmm. But it was the Satsuma clan that killed Richardson. Yes, and the British shelled. Satsuma land. Yes, and they became allies after that. Yeah, well, well, I think it was like, it's sometimes like, you know, sometimes when you get your ass kicked, mm. it sometimes wakes you up and go, oh, I need to change things. Mm. And so I was saying the Satsuma clan originally was revere the emperor, expel the foreigner. Right. But when the foreigner, like, d- demonstrated that they could kick ass. Yeah, it was like, oh, wait a minute, we need to modernize. Well, the, yes, but... um my impression from my reading of history is that, that, that most of the both sides equally mm. wanted to modernize. They just didn't want. Yeah. They they wanted to. They wanted trains and yes. an army and telegraphs. Ah, but and see, not at the modern beginning. Navy but not so at on. the beginning. See, mm. this, like I said, mm. the Bakamatsu is a mm. very confusing mm. period. Mm. It's the one of the things going all the way back to Sekigahara, the Battle of Sekigahara, yeah. set yeah. the the system up that mm. the Europeans found themselves into and didn't know what the situation was. Right. But prior to the prior to the um, prior to the, the Meiji Restoration, mm. the Tokugawa or the uh, mm. the um, uh, what did you call them? Sorry, I was calling them the Tokugawa. The well, you can say Tokugawa or the Bakufu. Yes, okay. Bakufu was, is the I'm, shogunate. I'm just trying to, the shogunate. Yes, I, I'm trying not to confuse our listeners by using a different term, yeah. but I tend to call say say that. Yeah. So. They were already drawing up plans for modernization. They, oh, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, yeah. Were, they were all, all they were yeah. totally in, in with it. I yeah. mean, the thing was, once once the battle was over, the two sides, apart from who is going to run things, yeah. there wasn't that much disagreement between yeah. them. That's why they were able to patch things up so easily. True. But, but what I was saying mm. is, the government that was mm. set up by the Tokugawa clan, yes. there was, they had a system where they had the um, inside lords and the outside mm. lords, mm. the Hudai mm. and the Tozama. Mm. The Tozama were all, 
by nature were always kind of anti Tokugawa. Mm. And so whenever they could take a stance against the shogunate, they would. Mm. Right. And so with with the the uh, shogunate's responses mm -hmm. in the 19th century yeah. towards foreign incursions, they immediately took the opposite side. Mm. And that's why they they favored the idea of, uh, if you say, so... Uh, so no joy? Yeah. Expel revere, the, the, revere the emperor, yeah. expel the foreigners. The foreigners. Yeah. They took that hard line stance. Mm. Uh, and But as you're right, the Tug which is interesting, the shogunate, which started the whole closing the country off, mm were also the first to open the country yeah. and realize yeah. they needed modernization. Yeah, but well, don't forget, when you say the shogunate, you're yeah. talking about their their descendants and you know, oh yeah yes, uh, yes. you know they they are, their mind their mindset had changed they already knew they were going to have to modernize oh yeah they did but mm. what I'm saying is their opponents such as Satsuma mm. Choshu and actually for a while Mito mm. uh, they were very anti foreign. Yeah, but they were not anti-modernization. They wanted mm -hmm. they, they they were trying to build a steam engine, for yeah. example. One uh, but but again again this occurred after. What I'm trying to say is yeah, like, yeah. there was a series of events mm -hmm. that changed their mind. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so that was yeah, before. Mm -hmm. So in a way, Richardson, you could almost say in a way, uh, did not die in vain, because the series of events that happened, Richardson was cut up by basically at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a because one of the things that was going on in that early period of the first foreigners. In Japan, was there was a lot of assassination of foreigners. Well, there was an average of one a week. Yeah, at one point. Yeah, so there was a a, a lot of anti foreign hostility. Of course, uh, going around and people being chopped up of many different nationalities: Russian, yeah. Dutch, American. Well, anybody British. who anybody who didn't well look foreign, basically. Yeah. yeah. And as I said, what's interesting is Satsuma and Choshu. In the beginning, they were like leading anti-foreign groups. Oh, yes, yes, of course. That's, yes. that's what I'm saying. Oh, no, I agree. Yeah. But then yeah. a mm. series of events happened. So when mm. Richardson gets cut up by mm. the Satsuma mm. clan, and then that leads to the bombardment of mm. Satsuma land, mm. and the Satsuma clan realizes, oh, my gosh, we are so far behind. Mm. We mm. need to change our way of thinking. And that's where the turn happened. I, they Then mm. they were no longer anti-foreign. They forged alliance with Britain. Mm. That's what I mean. Like so, yeah. it was, so like before Richardson, Satsuma was you know foreigner bad, but after uh, after the bombardment mm. by the British, they were like, oh wait a minute, you know maybe we should rethink this whole thing, and so then they got on board with opening and modernization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but the thing is. Whereas the Tokugawa clan, uh, the shogunate, was already opening and modernizing, the Satsuma and Choshu, especially Choshu, they were like, we're going to do it even more so. Like, mm. they really, mm. because mm. You know, Choshu, mm. so going kind of back to mm. Thomas Glover, yes. one of the things he did was smuggle the Choshu Five. He did indeed, yes. And who were the Choshu Five? Well, one they were one of them was he, 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 Ito Hirobumi, who became mm. the... President, uh, the prime minister, first prime minister. First prime minister. Uh, in fact, I think he was prime minister about four times. Mm. And there was, um, oh, off the top of my head, I've forgotten the names of all of them. Oh, and by the way, that's that's more in his second book, by the way. Mm. What's the name of this book? Um, Meeting the Twain. Yeah, so this is more the other mm. side. If you're wondering, like, we're only talking about foreign impact, mm. he also did the opposite of, oh, yeah. of yeah. the Japanese who, mm. one, allowed the Twain to meet and also had impact on Western yes. culture. But we'll talk about that in another but time. But the, the yeah. Choshu Five, I mean... I've I've forgot, I've forgotten all their names. Well, I, I've, their names off the top of my head. Oh, that's uh, right. There was Inoue Kaoru, was mm -hmm. another. He was a statesman, yeah. and the other three were more involved in industry because they Inoue Kaoru studied Inoue Kaoru studied um, legal systems, uh, mm. political systems, and so that was his 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 field. The other three members, they were start. One of them was stud He studied uh, printing mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. And he he came back and he established the printing press, yeah. the, the 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 Osaka Mint. Mm. Um, I've forgotten his name off the top of my head, but one um, of them, isn't one of them called the Father of Trains or something? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's correct. Yes, another one. Yeah, because he he was um, uh, he was very he was fascinated by steam engines when mm. he went to England, and another one he he spent the longest. I think he li he lived in he stayed in Scotland for a couple of years, and he. I think he studied engineering. So yeah, two of them were pretty similar mm. sort of field they were involved. But the thing is, our our, mm. our buddy Thomas Glover mm. was responsible for smuggling these five mm. samurai youths out yeah. of yeah. the Choshu region. That's right. 
and, and, and as you said, like, as I was saying before, originally Choshu was very anti-foreigner. Mm. Well, these guys were, they, they accepted, they thought, well, we've got to modernize. Mm. But once they arrived, I mean, they, they arrived in England, they were looking, what the hell? Yeah. They, they saw the London Underground had actually been completed a few months before they arrived. Oh, wow. It was 1863, I believe. Mm, mm, mm. And they they couldn't believe it. They could see these massive underground structures with the trains going through. They were like, what the? You know? Yeah. They were just blown away by it. So they were so impressed and they realized, yeah, we've got to do this as well. And I think that's one of the differences between the the shogunate's idea of modernization and Choshu and later Satsuma mm, mm. was the shogunate's idea of modernization was kind of slowly... Well, I, I, they were they were cherry picking as well. They yeah, wanted, there's a good point. They yeah. definitely did not want mm. Western culture. They just wanted our technology. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like you say. Well, I mean, the sort of some of the leaders of the Meiji Restoration, they wanted to build a, a, a network of trains. They wanted mm. they wanted industrialization, but they wanted to keep Japan Japan Japanese. If you yeah. like, so yeah. they they didn't want Christianity to be proselytized again. Mm. Although they gave in, they gave way on that one because mm. um, they realized that you know it probably wouldn't catch on, and wish it didn't. And uh, well, but but that, by the time of the nineteenth mm. century, it, would, mm. it was no longer like part of the imperialism uh, imperialism of the Spanish and the Portuguese. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean the uh, there were still still missionaries who came to Japan True. in the in the Meiji period, and they were a lot of them were Protestant actually. I think, yeah. and they were not obviously there would have been Catholic missionaries as well, but. The, it, it wasn't as hooked into the whole, you know, like, as oh. I said, the earlier Spanish. Well, no, this, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't remember reading about any Spanish or Portuguese, well, any any notable. Oh no, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the 15th and 1600s mm, mm, is when mm. the Spanish. Oh no, I know that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know that. What I'm trying to say is that in the Meiji period, the mm. Portuguese and the Spanish didn't play a major role no. in <laughs> Japan. They, they, they obviously the, they were there. There were some of tra traders yeah. and so on, and maybe a few missionaries even did show up. But they were they were not they didn't play a major role. No, I mean because because by that time, like England was I would mm. say one of the most major players. Well, England, on the planet. well, of course, yeah. England and Germany and Spain France. and Portugal were not nearly as powerful. Well, they yeah. were not, not even slightly as powerful yeah. as they had been. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> their 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 heyday had long exactly since exactly yeah. yes they yeah. Yeah, mm. but again, going back to our friend uh, Thomas Glover, Glover yes. he played such a key role in the background of all of mm. of all of this development yes. and the changing of the mindset mm. of the Satsuma and mm. Choshu clan, who, as I said before, were mm. anti foreigner and so on. But then yeah. they completely right. changed, mm. and then they wanted more modernization, right? And, faster and than you, the Tokugawa. Clan. Something else. Did you realize that, um, for example, Hito Irobu? Uh, Ito Hirobumi. Yeah, sorry, yes. I got his name mixed up. No, 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 that's Ito correct. Ito yeah. Hirobumi. I said yeah. Hito Hirobumi. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah not Hito. It's the sake. No, it's the sake. Yeah. No, Ito, uh, Ito, Ito. Ito Hirobumi spoke fluent English. Oh. Well, all wow. five of the Choshu, wow. the Choshu five, when they came back to Japan, mm. they were all fluent English speakers. Mm. And in fact, one of them, Enosuke, Enosuke, I've got his last name, he was the one who eventually went into the printing business. Ah. They, for the first few years, they said, right, you're an interpreter. They they kind of drafted yeah. him into interpret because that's what he could do. I mean, he what he his dream was to sort of get into the printing, you know, making money and printing and all the kind. But they said no, we need interpreters. So of course yeah. he was. He so was, and again, you mm. wonder like someone like Glover mm. when he agreed to take these five mm. at that time would have been just you know like they were they were sixteen or something? no 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 oh. they were the youngest one was about nineteen and the okay. others were twenty one twenty two. Okay, but still very young men. Yes. He With not a, a lot of Glover didn't yeah. take them. He put them on a ship. Yeah. Okay. Okay. He 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 got them. He paid the captain some money to put I them see. on the ship, and he the, the captain took them out and ship. And yeah. there is a, there is a movie called The Choshu Five, mm. uh, made in Japan about fifteen years ago, which is kind of a more or less sticks to the facts. But yeah. they it okay. It's a it's, a, it's a, there's a few scenes that they added just to spice it up. Yeah. Yeah. But essentially, it it tells the story of what happened, and it's very entertaining. It's, okay. it's Mostly in Japanese, of course, but you could you could get it in maybe I don't know if there's a subtitled version. There probably is. You could probably find. I enjoyed it. I watched it. But the thing is, like Glover, when he did this, he probably didn't think much about it because, like, oh, I'm getting money to get these guys he onto this ship. Glover was um, my impression of Glover was that he, I mean, he was driven by the idea of making money. Yeah. Uh, he was he was just, and I I think he was totally into 
the whole development of Japan thing. Mm. I think he was. I think he was very. I think he actually was very fond of Japan. I think he mm. liked. It does uh, seem that way. Yeah. Just, I, I get that impression. It's, it's difficult to judge. Some of these people are very hard to get yeah. sort of into their mind and what they were thinking. Like Glover was. I mean, Glover never really learned to speak Japanese very mm. well. He always used interpreters. Yeah, and he did. He, there was a reason for that because he always wanted to have the upper hand. So mm. if, he, if he used an interpreter, then he could. And my get my guess is he could actually understand some of what was uh, going. He could, but pretend he did. His, his listening skills were better than his speaking, like yeah. a lot of people. So yeah. he could. And so my impression from what I read that he's he always used interpreters, mm. or he just spoke English, and you guys, speak, you know. You <laughs> so uh, that's it. But the main thing is, uh, it's like we could go on on Glover f for ages. Oh, that's what I'm this, saying. Yeah, this man, it's mm, just like he, he had such an impact yeah. on the mm. Meiji Restoration. That's right. Mm. Um, so I'd love to stay on him, mm. uh, but but mm. time is pressing. Time is pressing indeed. Uh, I was I, just going to mention like one of his contemporaries. Mm. Ah, please uh, do. Uh, so we mentioned Glover amongst many of the things he did. He mm. also started the Kieran Beer Company. Yes, and let me. Make oh, yes. Yes. Oh, and here it is now. This uh, one is of his friends started another. Uh, Earlier attempt at a beer company. Well, it wasn't his friend exactly. No, oh. he was one. Of, well, that well, maybe maybe they became friends. You could be right, but that's not the point. Um, Miss Stuart, Miss not. I said I just said Stuart Copeland. That he was a composer. Sorry, <laughs> Aaron Copeland. No, Stuart Copeland was the was the drummer with the Police. William Sorry. Copeland. William Copeland. Thank you. Which uh, I, Aaron Copeland composed the American something symphony, right? Okay. Which we drank. Uh, no, sorry, I'm, I'm drunk. A friend no, of mine. Drunk, we drank this beer in another video. Okay, now let me see. Let me see. Yes. Okay, so um, Copeland. Copeland, William Copeland, was Norwegian-born, uh, emigrated to America. He came to Japan, and he, he, he'd learned about brewing and so on. So he set up the Spring Valley Brewery in Yokohama. And this Spring Valley, this is the... They revived Spring Valley about five years ago, I mm. think. And he, he was the first commercial brewer in Japan. He was very successful. Sadly, the economy went downhill... Mm. And beer was a luxury item at the time, so of course he went. He went. He was almost bankrupt, and then Glover bought him out. Ah. Glover bought him out, and then uh, Copeland. Then Copeland and his Jap young Japanese wife. A few years later, they went. They moved to Guatemala to try and make a life there, but mm. it didn't work out. Then he came back to Japan. He died in Japan when he was about sixty-seven. Oh, okay. So he. Um, but meanwhile. Glover had a look at the Spring Valley and he says, yeah, yeah, this is good. But he then decided to improve it. So he kept on trying, mm. used, he tried new brews, new brews, new you know, uh, formulas, whatever. And he came up with the Kilin brand. Kilin, by the way, was his daughter's drawing. That lovely drawing of the Kilin dragon oh, wow. is oh, his 13-year-old wow. daughter, Hannah. She drew that. Mm. And if you look at pictures of, of Glover, he has a long Victorian mustache, you know, those mm. long handlebar. And so mm. she gave the dragon a handlebar mustache. Ah. If you look carefully, you'll notice the dragon has this long flowing So mustache. yeah, if you look at a Kirin beer can. Yeah, have a look at the beer, you'll see what I mean. Yeah. And, and his daughter, Hannah, of course, uh, she drew this for him. And he then um, created the Kirin, well, it was called, the, first, the company was just called the Japan Brewing Company or right, some yeah. name like that, yeah. I think. Was that, oh, that was all good. Well, I mean, that's what I read in your book. <laughs> well, that, I was trying to remember what was in my book, because uh -huh. I wrote it a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but um, uh, the Kirin, uh, that company eventually was bought out by Mitsubishi, mm. and they renamed the company Kirin because they oh, thought, well, okay. Kirin was the most popular beer. It was the yeah. flagship beer. So, well, they renamed the company Kirin, oh, okay. Kirin, Kirin Beverages, or Kirin, yeah. Kirin, I think it was Kirin Beverages, they called it. I see. And, but then Spring Valley, the, Spring Valley the, the original Spring Valley beer was revived uh, they found you know the original formula as close as they can get to it. And oh wow! So this is the original uh, as, close close as, enough as close as close as they can get to it. Of the 1870. 1870 was when it was started. I see. And oh wow! So Spring Valley is a it's a very nice beer. I I, like. Well, do you want to pour? Oh, why not? I'll pour for you. You pour for me. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's yours. Uh, I'll pour yours. You We're not Japanese. Like... We don't need to oh. pour our own. Don't be silly. Bloody oh. British. Good lord. There we go. Right. Well, I wanted to do the mama. I know you did, and you're not going to with me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So this, this we're just going to have a toast to Copeland. Yes, indeed. And Glover, because he and had Glover. a point yes, with, he did. Uh, yes, with, indeed. with both of them. Oh, well, here's, okay. here's to Glover and, and, and Copeland. Oh, yes. And um, good lads. Now, so, as we said, Glover oh, helped... Oh, good. Yeah, it is, isn't mm, it? It's nice. 
Glover helped with the modernization of Japan. He did. Indeed. And that led to more and more foreigners coming into of Japan. Course, because uh, you said the... Um, the Oyatoi Gaikokujin? Yes. The, what o- is that? Okay, Oyatoi Gaikokujin. Oyatoi means mm. honorably, honorable hired foreigners. Mm. Literal translation. In other words, it meant um, teachers slash... Um, industrialists, whatever. Mm. They, they, a lot of them were hired to work at a university part of the time, yes. uh, teaching and doing research and so on. So some of them divided their time between being lecturers and being researchers and mm. um, and and helping the Japanese set up various um, whatever you know, like factories and so forth. So, but some of them were hired purely as teachers, mm. and some of them were hired purely to set up things. I mean, they. They hired, um, they don't know how many, because the governments hired about 3,000 of them over a 30 year period, 35 mm. year period, starting in 18, around 1865, mm-hmm. and the program was terminated in 1899. So, so there, it was started actually under the shogunate. It was indeed. Yeah, that's, it, that's was, gonna, it, it wasn't it, called, I don't know when, when they officially yeah. named it that, but yeah. it was. So as I was saying, the shogunate yeah. did start, yeah. you know, the, as I was well, trying to say. Mm. Well, it's like the mm. Meiji reformers realized, like, well, mm. the shogunate had a few good ideas. Oh no, I mean, let's they, continue this. They had yeah. absolutely yeah. no problem with it. In yeah. fact, one of the one of the men who was hired by the, to- the to- Tokugawa yeah. to build uh, Yokohama Harbor, mm. he was a Frenchman, mm. uh, Verny, Monsieur Verny, and he was worried when the government changed. He thought, oh, they're going to fire me, but no, yeah. they didn't. They said, you keep going, you're doing a good ah, job. Keep yeah. it up. So they kept him. So I think they held on to or kept a hold of a lot yeah. of people, and. So they, uh, well, as I was saying, yeah, the, the program was terminated in 1899. Now, do you know why do you, why do you think it was terminated? They got what they needed? Precisely. Oh, well done. Woo-hoo! What do I win? Absolutely you can finish not. that beer and oh, I, won't, okay. I won't try to stop you. Okay. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it, it is interesting that, th- that that part of that was what helped the, what they call the Meiji miracle. Exactly. It was it was possibly the most impressive transfer of technology. Oh. Um, that's uh, well, obviously, other co- since then other countries have emulated it. But yeah. I think the Japanese uh, were the first to literally in thirty five mm. years go from being a, uh, a pre industrial yeah. feudal society mm-hmm. to a modern society that could that had beaten uh, had beaten the Russians by nineteen o five. Yes, indeed. Oh, well, slightly more than forty years, uh, but had beaten had had defeated. Um, the the Russians, as I say, the Russians, and had already t- taken control of uh, Taiwan and so on. Well, I mean, the thing about mm-hmm. from the time when Japan was forced to be open in eighteen fifty three mm-hmm. to be able to tackle a major European power mm-hmm. such as Russia mm-hmm. in nineteen o four, and then know, that's right, and yes. and decisively defeat them by nineteen o five. They kicked their ass. Oh God, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. the Battle of Tsushima. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's like European powers are like, whoa, what the heck? <laughs> but amongst those people that were part of this program, of you, you were mentioning some of them were researchers, or sorry, they were, they were lecturers. Well, yeah, a and, lot of uh, there a lot. Some of them were researchers, and right. but they were given sort of they were lecturers, but they were also given tasks to sort of do well, research in their spare time in the when they went. What I was going to bring up was mm. uh, Morse. Morse was a teacher. But Morse introduced a lot of people to Japan. Now Morse was, he, uh, Dr. Morse was yes. an American um, archaeologist. American, uh, well, he, he archaeology was his hobby, I think. Oh, well, uh, he was actually a, 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 bio, a, a, a sure. marine yeah. marine biology was his thing. Uh, he came to Japan on holiday, mm-hmm. and the Japanese government, when they realized who it was, because he was quite well known, yeah. they offered him a teaching position in I think it was to- Todai Tokyo yeah. University. And he accepted it, but on one condition, he said, I want to go back to America and bring my wife back with me. Mm. And so they said, okay, that's no problem. So four years he stayed in Japan. He taught, he, well, he was also, archaeology was his hobby. Mm-hmm. And the Omori, the Omori yeah, shell Omori, mound, yeah. Omori was a, a prehistoric shell mound. Well, I mean, it's basically with the shells that the people had dumped there after they've eaten the shellfish. Yeah. And he, res- he, he was also interested in pottery. He was one of these kind of, um, what do they call them, um, Renaissance men. Mm-hmm. He was, a lot of these A little people, bit of everything. Yeah, yeah, a lot of these, you notice a lot of the people yeah. in my book, a lot of them were... Especially 19th century oh, people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They didn't stick to their field at all. They, they were interested in everything. Morse also introduced a lot of people because the university asked him, 
uh, we need some, we need a scientist, we need this, we need that. And he'd say, yeah, I know somebody. And so he'd write off a letter and they would, mm. so several people came to Japan because of him. Yeah. He was very influential. Yeah. Mm. But I was saying is like, mm. um, Morse is responsible for, you see, rediscovering the Jomon culture. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That mm. this culture that existed for at least 10,000 years but had disappeared in the pages of history. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it was... Because uh, it was yeah, so long yeah, ago. Exactly. Mm. That he, in the Omori shell mounds, Correct. he found the 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 Jomon culture. Like, right, right. Yeah. Mm. So it's kind of interesting. Like I think even the name... I'm not, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the name Jomon came from an area where they first discovered some of no. the... No? Um, Jomon is actually the name of the pottery. Because it's interesting, ah, you said he yeah. he liked mm, pottery. Mm, mm, mm. Jomon means ah. rope mark pottery. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's a new name. So we, so the actual name that these people might have used for themselves, we have no idea. Right, right. No, uh, right. You're thinking of the Yayoi. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I was confused. That, that was, too. Yeah, quite right. That was... Yayoi was, a, was an area, yeah. and that's where the name came... That's right, yes. That's where yeah. the name came from. Yeah. But but I would say the Yayoi period, the, the discoverer of the Yayoi period mm -hmm. was inspired by Morse. Oh, yeah. Well, Morse, Morse, was, a, Morse was like uh, the, the glover of the science world, yeah. if you like, in Japan. But to think, like, to, to discover this ancient prehistoric mm -hmm. uh, civilization mm -hmm. that had, had been slumbering uh, underneath... You know, Japanese soil. Well, I suppose for, it was yeah. it was not you know like the Rosetta Stone mm. un unlocked a lot of uh, yeah. historical documents. So it, it's interesting so, that a foreigner mm. like suddenly go, oh hey, you have this ten thousand years of prehistoric uh, culture mm. that's been mm. here. You mm. know, yeah. yeah, And that's how we were able to find out about like the Shaku uh, Doji, the 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 interesting uh, doji. Jomon uh, oh, do do Dogu. 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 Sorry, dogu. yeah, you're right. Dogu. Sorry. Dogu, um, dogu. Yeah, the beer starting. The beer and the sake is hitting me. Dogu, dogu. thank you. Yeah, uh, statues. Well, Eric, Eric von Dankheim, in his book *Chariots of the <laughs> Gods*, he used the dogu figurines to suggest that ancient astronauts had landed in Japan. Which they had. Well, I don't know. They might have done. Yeah, and why are they not in your book? Um, this book is bunk. <laughs> Why well, I didn't have room, you know. <laughs> and, yeah, Aliens I, can write their own damn book. Let's just put it that way. Well, yeah. But yeah, so Morse was... Uh, Are so, you an alien? But so Morse, he basically brought the Jomon culture into Japan, mm. to understand. Mm. And then from that, was interesting, um, further along that line, was the translators of the religious texts. Ah, William Aston. Yes. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Oh, you got the book. Oh, yeah. my goodness. This is one of... This looks like the original cover, I think, of huh. William I Aston. I believe it is, yeah. William Aston was... Uh, I think it was Irish, but Northern Irish, I think. Thing. Oh no, he was not. No, at that point, it wasn't Northern Ireland. He was Irish, and he worked in Japan. And he he was part of the um, British legation. Mm. But he his hobby was uh, was basically Japanology, as they called mm. it. That that was a term that came in in about eighteen seventy two, three something. The study of Japan, Japanology, mm. they called it. And he was one of the original Japanologists. And he translated the Nihongi, which is a a book or of, Nihon Shoki, as they say in Japan, yeah. Yeah, 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 well, uh -huh, correct. And he translated this book. And also, the other one was the... Well done, there it is, the Kojiki, yeah. which he also translated. That's, oh, no, no, uh, th this was a different translator. Oh. Uh, uh, Chamberlain. Oh, my mistake, my mistake. Yeah. Yeah, of course it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, Cham Chamberlain, Basil, Basil Chamberlain, yeah. Basil Hall Chamberlain. Yeah. He, Basil Hall Chamberlain was another... Well, he and... Uh, Aston. Aston and Chamberlain and um, um, not bad, two other members, I think, that were of this group. And they were the they were the group that worked on a lot of translations mm. and a lot of language studies. That's right. Um, but me personally, mm. when it comes to these two, I've read both of them. Mm, me too. And I would yeah. say Aston, I prefer his translation mm. more than Chamberlain because in Aston, mm. he uses the Japanese names throughout the text. Mm. For example... Mm. Susanono Mikoto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll have a footnote, and it'll say um, impetuous male or something. Right. But Chamberlain, he'll use impetuous male throughout the text. Ah, uh, yeah. And, yeah, mm. like, for example, like, he'll say, um, uh, like, he'll say... Uh, well, maybe uh, he was going for a more readable book. In I, I get yeah, it, but it's like... A general reader, maybe. But, but when it says, Princess Blossoming Brilliantly... 
Well, I mean, I mean, yes, that is a translation. No, no, but Dave, the, this, there's always this, when you're translating foreign names mm-hmm. of country, you know, place names and so on. There's always been this debate between should you keep the name, the original name, or should you translate it and give them translation meaning, which imparts more meaning to the name, or should you keep the name as original? For example, should you say, uh, should you say Fuji San, or should you say Mount Fuji? But then, then there's my name. Even. My name is David, which is actually from the Hebrew. Yes. If you were to translate it, you'd be calling me Beloved. Mm, well, there you go. Do you, you want to go around going, Beloved, would you like another beer? No, I wasn't taking... <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't taking sides. I was just... Oh, no, no, but I, I understand I was, what you're saying. I was yeah. just pointing out that there's always been that debate mm. within translations of, you know, tr- translators and and. But uh, my point is, historians. I believe Aston took the correct approach. Yeah, yeah. So mm, in I his so. text, mm. um, of, I mean, they're both... The two books, we don't have time to go into it, but the two books are, are similar of the tracing of J- Japanese mythology and mm, history. Mm. In his, he introduces the Japanese name with a, f- with a footnote that tells you the meaning in, in English. Mm. Yeah. But he, throughout the main text, he uses Keeps the, the Japanese. Same name. Yeah. I, I actually prefer that, as you say. Yeah. I think that's better because... Um, you know, keeping the name, people's people's names are important. Yeah. Me? So, like, in, yeah. if you read, like, Basil Chamberlain and you try to say to a Japanese person, ah, the god, he who oh, rises, yeah. they'd be like, what? That's stupid. But if you, if you read Aston and you go, oh, uh, Can, uh, 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 Izanagi no Mikoto, they go, oh, yeah, okay. Right, right. Yeah, or they'll know exactly. Inazu, you Inazu, and Inazumi or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I, Izanagi right. was the male, Izanami was yeah, the yeah, female. Yeah, 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 that was, yeah. yeah. Now, also with the major period, um, I think we should mention the British consul, uh, Alcock. What was oh, his name? Alcock, yes. yes. Alcock was the first, I think, the first British consul. Mm. And he was also the first, I think he was the first uh, foreign, foreigner, maybe, to climb to the top of Mount Fuji. Mm. I'm not sure if that's, maybe he was, I think he might have been the first. Okay. I think he's, certainly his wife, I think his wife was the first Western woman to climb to the top of Fuji. So maybe mm. they both went together, I don't know for <laughs> sure. But um, yeah, he he was um, he actually started out in uh, as an envoy to China, mm. I believe. Yeah. What was his views on Japan? Um, well, he 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 was really interested in Japan. Mm. He wrote when he retired. He wrote a book all about Japan, and he he was active sort of in the uh, Asiatic Society of Japan. Mm-hmm. He was you know he was very he was very interested in the cultural side, and he encouraged. Uh, I think. Um, you know, he he was he encouraged his people to learn Japanese and to. Okay. He was trying to. I think he tried. He was actually trying to learn Japanese himself right. when he first came over. Because sometimes there is this impression mm. of nineteenth-century Europeans and Americans as being very uh, imperialistic culturally wise and, and some looking were, down some, on the I Japanese. Think, to be honest, but, some were, some weren't. Right. I think. I think. Um, you. I don't know. I mean, some some definitely were, and some mm. weren't. I think. Um, I think a lot of the successful ones weren't. I think because they. Mm. The ones who were probably didn't stay very long. That's a good point. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But uh, um, I think I, I think a lot of the people who were in this book, I think they they either liked or loved or at least respected mm. the culture of Japan. I think they and they um, you know they 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 wanted to either make make an impression here, they wanted to to live here, or they wanted to they were interested in something about Japan. They wanted to introduce to the West. Yeah. Like Arthur Whaley translating the Tale of Genji, for example. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now you you had mentioned you wanted to talk about Edwin Dunn. Edwin Dunn, yes, briefly. Edwin Dunn was an interesting man because no, for on a personal note, mm. Edwin Dunn uh, came to Japan when he was twenty five. Mm-hmm. He planned to stay a couple of years, and he stayed for well, he was first here for ten years. He tried to return to his own country, and he found that he his habits had become so fixed mm. that he was no longer happy back in America. Hmm. So he. And then he came back to Japan and he got a, he was actually take, hired as the I think he was the envoy to the American envoy at the embassy for several years and then after that he worked for a uh, oil company uh, I don't remember Standard Oil or something oh, like yeah. that I don't remember the name but no so I felt I could uh, I could relate to that because I've lived in Japan a long time mm. and I've wanted to leave basically but I tried to leave before and I felt. I missed things about the country because I got used to them, so I could I could really relate to him. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so there, yeah, that I think his his statement was very much like expats 
around uh, from any country. Oh yeah, understand. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they yeah. become part. Do not of expect. Do not expect to be able to return to your country and just take up where you left off. And, and another person similar to that was uh, another person you wanted to talk about, mm. which of course many people know. La- La- Lafcadio Hearn. Yes. Lafcadio Hearn. Yeah. Um, basically, I re- I can relate to him even more so because. Uh, he became very disillusioned with modern Japan. He didn't like it. He was into the old. I, I, hmm. I imagine. I don't know you very well, Dave. I imagine you're probably the same. You're very. Int- you're very into the culture. Yeah. The history. Modern day Japan. I. I get the impression maybe you're not terribly crazy about. Yeah, yeah, some parts are okay. Okay. But yeah. I, I, but I, mm. yeah, most of the stuff I go to festivals and. Yeah, I have no. So that's on, what I meant. Traditional so, Japan. That's what I was trying to. My feeling yeah. was that based on what I know of them. Yeah. Me too. I have very little interest in modern Japan. It. it it doesn't there's nothing there to interest me yeah um the culture the history the old culture the history is what drew me to the country and the fact that uh, basically um the modern japan is is really of no interest to me to be honest so but what did lafcadio 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 his name his his name came from lafcadia the island where he was ah, lafcadia Lef, Lef, i think it is it's in, pronounced. in greece right yes yes and what did he do? I mean, he hopefully translated. people know this. He came to Japan and he translated a lot of mm. old ghost stories. Yes. And he was one of the first uh, English, I don't know whether he was one of the first, but he's certainly one of the first English people to, to nat- naturalize as a mm. Japanese. And also he became very disillusioned because once he was naturalized, they cut his wages because they didn't have to pay him on the oyatoi. Oh, wow. The oyatoi wage. Wow. No, no, you're a Japanese now. Oh, you'll get whatever Japanese wages. <laughs> so he's like, oh, oh what the heck? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. and he was, he was kind of, a lot of people th- thought that he was uh, very, you know, was a, a really a loved Japan, but actually he had a love-hate relationship mm. with Japan. He, he detested the modernization of Japan. Mm. He was in love with the tea houses yeah. and the romantic images that yes, he, he'd, yeah. he'd come to know. Ah, interesting. Now, another thing about, um, uh, to get things going, um, another thing about uh, about kind of traditional mm. Japan from our perspective, because mm. it's 150 years old, yeah. is the soda Oh, that many people drink at festivals. Oh, ramune. Ramune. Yeah. That, that many Japanese, I believe, think it's Japanese. They probably do. Yeah. yeah. And oh, you've have, got one here. Yes, oh, yeah. one for oh, each of us. Oh, thank you. Where oh. did this ramune? Where did that come from? Well, the ramune, uh, ramune is just a Japanese Japanese version of lemonade. That's ah. where they got. Um, it was it was a, a, a Scottish chemist who moved to Kobe. He came to Kobe in eighteen sixty nine, and he decided to make a soft drink that would appeal to the foreign community. Oh. He didn't. He didn't think the Japanese would be into it. He wanted to make some sort of soft drink. So, and again, this is a theme of these people, who who have no idea what they're doing. That it would have such a big impact. Mm, that's right. And yet now, mm. like any time you come to summer matsuri, uh, mm. summer festivals, yes. you see these mm. being sold and all the time. I'll point out this. This bottle, it's yeah. it's called a cod necked bottle because mm. it was um it was it was the invention of an an English inventor called Hiram Cod. That's mm. that's the cod necked bottle, and the the little the little ball that you can see. The I little, don't know if you yeah, can see it. Marble. The marble yeah. at the top here. When you push that out, then you can drink it. Yeah. And the bottles can be recycled because yeah. it's a, So it was like an earlier an early idea of recycling absolutely. before recycling absolutely. was even a thing. And so this and then but the, the drink became really popular with the Japanese mm. and, and Sim was I think he was quite surprised about that because mm. he was think he was only trying to make a drink for the, the foreign community yeah. in Corbett. He didn't he didn't think it would be popular, but it was. So he was, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. Uh, you know, yeah, good, and like good, now, good. it's people. Mm. It's so traditional yeah. Japanese that they don't even know that well, it came from yeah, this foreign. There you go. Well, it's, right, like, it's we... like my mother never knew that hydrangeas came from Japan. Mm, did she? Sure. Same sort of thing. So shall we try a sip of this in in honor of? Oh, wait, I have no idea. I have no Yeah, actually, <laughs> this this idea. Is... How does this work? I don't know. I just tried to hit it under the table. I don't think that works. Yeah, I don't. Um, um, hold on. You turn it, maybe. No, it doesn't work. Hold on. Jesus, um, I thought it was ID. You just push it down. I mean, too. I thought you just pushed it. Uh, Wait a minute. Oh, well, I know. I know. Wait oh. a minute. Look. This one. You, you push it with this. Ah, that's what that whole thing is maybe. for. Maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, my God. No. no. Oh, crikey. I need to get in the gym. Ah. Oh, that's not good, is it? Oh, this is ruining my whole... <laughs> oh, it does, yeah. I, I... Jeez, how the fuck do you open a remote? <laughs> 
don't don't <laughs> swear. There might be children watching. Oh no no. I mean I'm gonna edit. That oh part okay. Of that's it. what I'm saying. Like, don't fucking swear. I told you. Hmm. Okay. Oh my god. No no. It's it's that's it's that's not good. How the fuck? How the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. How the fuck? Just. Hey, we should keep that in. It's funny. Yeah. yeah. We should keep that in. It's funny. <laughs> that we're so incompetent <laughs> that we don't know how to open a Ramoni. A remote Ramune. Ra- Ramune. Ramune. That's good. Very good. Ramune. Well done. Well done. That we don't know how to open a Ramune. Yeah, because now I think about it, I never really drink this. Me too. It's, I don't. <laughs> I don't actually like it. So yeah. let's not. Tell you what. Why don't we just give it to someone else? Yeah, that, that's it's much idea. easier. We don't have to find somebody who knows how to open this. Yeah, so well, find someone who likes it. It's, it's so sweet. I don't yeah. like it to be honest. <laughs> okay, that was an absolute failure. But let, let, just, just to yeah. wrap up the Meiji mm. period. Okay, yes. I was just going to say the last part was um, you wrote about the I guess like the German or maybe at this time it was the Prussians because yes. you know Germany. It was well Germany. Well, no. The, the one, when we when you say German, when I say German in my book, it generally means Pru- it's not always, but mostly it was mm. Prussian. Yes, the northern northern part yeah. area. Their influence on Meiji constitution and law. Well, yes. Well, the the Russian the the Prussians had influence on Meiji constitution because um, Kaoru Inoue, he was one of the the Choshu Five. He he spent time in Europe studying the various constitutions, and he was most impressed with Prussia, with mm. the Prussian top-down sort of uh, dictatorship, benign dictatorship, as yeah. you would call it. Okay. And he felt it would fit, because they had the the the, Tsar, the, 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 Kaiser, the Kaiser, and he felt yeah. that this would fit in nicely with Japan, with the emperor and so on. It would all, it would be a modern version of mm. what they already had. Perhaps that's what he was thinking, I don't know. But um, And also, another field that medis- uh, was medicine. Mm. A lot of early um, medical trainers, medical, medical teachers, were uh, German. Uh, thus, you can look well. It, it reflects in the Japanese language. For example, the word for scalpel is messu. Oh. That comes from the German mess, which is the German for, for scalpel. Uh, karute means chart, a medical chart. Karute. Oh. The uh, and there are other words I've forgotten, but there are several words that oh, um, are used. That the Japanese took straight from German. Mm. Uh, neuroise for for neurosis. Ne- oh. The German neuro. I, I'm not I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Neuroise. Neuroise. I think it's something like that. Um, neurosis. Well, I studied German in high school, so of course I don't know. <laughs> well, it doesn't surprise me. And um, then there was also, you know, words like that, which came into the language due to the German influence. Mm. Yeah. So, so. The- and again, it, it's rather interesting that like, Japan didn't just take um, uh, inspiration from one no. uh, foreign power. Like, <sighs> so, you well, know. Let me let me let me, oh, yeah, let yeah. me explain something that you've just you've just pointed out that I, I should have mentioned. Mm. When the whole Oyatoi Gaikokushin, the foreign, uh, the, the the foreign, basically the foreign trainers, teachers, mm. whatever you want to call them, program started, the Japanese figured out that they they would they would mainly hire people from specific countries for specific needs. America was agriculture, Britain was industry, ah. France was navy, Germany was doc, was medical uh, medical and mm. then mm. and then military. Mm-hmm. Uh, Italy was the arts, so oh, uh, wow. painting, okay. decorate, painting, mm. uh, carving, sculpting. Yeah, and then of course, ah, and the Dutch. Go on. But what? The Dutch. What were Dutch? They hired the Dutch for. Can you guess? I don't know. Waterworks. Dam- oh, damming, oh. damming rivers, dams. Sticking fingers into dikes. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, whatever <laughs> floats your boat, man, baby. Whatever floats Good your boat. On Saturday night. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure the dike won't mind. Well, she'll probably slap you around the head. <laughs> but anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> um, <laughs> I got you there, didn't I? <laughs> anyway, no, but seriously, um, the, uh, the the Dutch they were hired to to build well for for redirecting mm. water for building um, various waterways and ah, canal yes. construction and that kind of thing because that's what they were good at. Yeah, they the Japanese um, had this the impression of each country's strengths and weaknesses mm. as what they could learn from them. So yeah. that's why they... Pr- but they, they didn't exclusively hire from those countries. But on the whole, if you look through the book, you'll see quite yeah. often that's what mm. happened. And sometimes, of course, they'd have a... a Brit- for example, a British uh, uh, hired man or woman would recommend somebody else. Yeah. So they'd of, of, often they'd mm. bring, up, you know, bring the friends or something. But I would say, like, uh, to wrap up the major period, yes. one of the things, even though, like, they brought in many foreigners and they also sent many Japanese out to learn mm. from different areas. Yes, uh, they did. Different yes, areas. they did. What what is interesting about it is that that Japan didn't just become like a um, like a shadow uh, European country. 
Like it still maintained a Japanese identity. It did um, for a long time, mm. but um, you could argue that modern Japan is is well essentially the Japanese lead Western lifestyles. You could mm. argue. I mean, this is what the British Embassy uh, in the eighteen in nineteen seventies they concluded that in many ways Japan was essentially a Western country now. But, I mean, true, but I, I would say Western, but. With a Japanese aesthetic, of still. course, yeah, I would, and I agree with yeah. you. I wasn't saying I agreed yeah. with what the British Embassy said. Mm. I'm saying that's what they said. Yeah, and the British Embassy pointed out that, in many ways, I mean, look at this apartment. I mean, it's it's pretty much okay. They've got, they've got the shoji screens behind us, mm. but the rest of it, it, you know, it doesn't look particularly Japanese, yeah. does it? It could be, you know, anywhere. But, uh, like I said, I think Japan was more fortunate than say China. Well, yeah, China, in the, in, yeah, because yeah, China absolutely. got mm. kind of. Yeah, carved up. Yeah, by the European imperialist nations. It was. It was. Um, yeah. It was, yeah. Uh, that that amazingly, like Japan, despite being behind uh, behind technologically wise, was able to open their country, bring in all this influence, and uh, and mm. yet still maintain a cultural and right. national right. identity. Right. I'm less familiar with the history of China, but I believe it was partly the. The prevalent prevalent attitude of the Chinese at that time that they they felt that their culture was superior and they, they yeah. had nothing to learn from outside. They didn't yeah. really want to be bothered. I I, I, may, I could be wrong on that, but that's the impression I got from my reading. But uh, but the but what Japan was like, we have a lot to learn. Mm, they were they, the Japanese were more realistic. Yeah, mm, yeah. But as I said, what's amazing, like their identity was not completely yeah yeah, uh, yeah I quite submerged. Agree. Like totally the, agree with yeah. you. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Anyway, that, that was, was a major mirror miracle. Um, Making miracle. And That's what next, I we will talk about the modern era of the 20th century. We will indeed. Up until to today. Well, yeah. Yes. Or no, probably yesterday. All right. Or yesterday. Mm, most likely. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. See Kampai. you. Kampai. There you go. Right. Woo, strong. <laughs>